evening, everyone. I'd like to call this evening's King's Local School Board of Education public meeting to order. Mr. Morrow, could you please call the roll? Ms. Phillips? Here. Ms. Groff? Here. Ms. Cowan? Here. Mr. Skirl? Here. Mr. Balfrom? Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. May I have a motion to approve this evening's agenda? I will make that motion. I'll second the motion. Mr. Morrow? Ms. Cowan? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Groff? Yes. Mr. Skirl? Yes. Mr. Belfrom? Yes. First up on this evening's agenda, we have quite a few reports and presentations this evening. Packed house, which is always fun. <laughs> uh, so I will turn it over to Mr. Sears. Yes, thank you, President Belfrom and King's Board and everyone in attendance today. Thank you for joining us for our board meeting this evening. We're really excited this evening as um, it's an opportunity for us to, as we start to um, recognize many of the tremendous folks who have had great service to King's local school district over many years. Um, I say this in, in education so many times that folks are required to often do what's best for students or do what's best for other people. And this is one decision, making the decision to retire that they get to do what's best for them. So we celebrate that. We're really excited about the opportunities that, uh, that our retirees have moving forward. Um, and so I've asked Mr. Spinner here tonight. He is going to recognize and say a few things about each of our retirees in attendance today. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Spinner. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Congratulations, as Mr. Sears said, to the following staff on their retirement from the King's Local School District. Many of them are here with us tonight, but unfortunately not all of our staff members who retired this school year could join us this evening. However, we would still like to recognize them and thank them for their service. They are as follows. King's Junior High School Assistant Principal, Mr. Brett Allen. Columbia Intermediate School Math Teacher, Rafaela Freck. J.F. Burns Elementary Media Center School Specialist, Gwen Houston. And J.F. Burns Elementary School Administrative Assistant, Ray Mitchell. So if we could give them a round of applause. Today. Service to Kings. In attendance this evening, if you would please step forward when your name is called so that we could recognize you. We also have some wonderful Kings mementos here up front as well. Um, in attendance tonight, we are fortunate to have Amy Constable, Margaret Griffin, Sue Ellen Cook, Andy Olds, Jim Riley, and Kathy Wells. So please step forward. Come on down. <laughs> right up front. Coach, how are you? Good. I'm going to start off tonight with Miss Amy Constable. Amy yeah. has dedicated 36 years to making a difference. The last 33 of those years in Kings, most recently at Columbia Intermediate School with so many amazing people. Throughout her time here, she has been in five buildings at five grade levels and has taught all four core subjects. Amy is thankful for everyone who has been a part of her daily life and personal growth throughout her career. She is eager to see what God has in store for her next. Congratulations, Amy. Yeah. There, sir. We have a wonderful King's Blanket for each of you tonight. Margaret Griffin. Margaret Griffin served Kings as a speech and language pathologist for a total of 23 years, most recently at Kings Junior High School. Prior to that, she was an SLP at Good Samaritan Hospital for 15 years. Margaret is looking forward to spending more time with friends and family, as well as hiking, traveling, and reading. She also plans to return to pet therapy with her dog, Sunny, and work intermittently as an SLP. Congratulations, Marg.
Sue Ellen Cook. Sue Ellen Cook served the education industry for a total of 32 years, 29 of those years in the King's local school district, also most recently at Columbia Intermediate School as a science and social studies teacher. She is most looking forward to skipping 6.15 a.m. wake-up calls <laughs> and celebrating her daughter's graduation from high school. She enjoys reading books and will no longer have to wait for breaks in order to dive into them. Additionally, Sue Ellen plans to devote more time to fostering animals and pet rescue. She intends to travel and may even return to sub for her former colleagues at CIS. Congratulations, Sue Ellen. Andy Olds. Andy Olds has been a fixture in the world of education for 38 years. 32 of those years were spent in Kings as a physical education, health, you're welcome, and character and leadership teacher. There's a story behind that we'll save for later. Furthermore, after 21 successful seasons as the head football coach at Kings High School, Andy was named the 2018 winner of the Paul Brown Excellence in Coaching Award, among many other accolades, both individually and as a team. In retirement, he is moving to Lookout Mountain in Rising Fawn, Georgia, hoping to fish a lot, something tells me that's going to happen, <laughs> as well as teach character and leadership at the college level in Chattanooga. Congratulations, Andy. Jim Riley, a proud 1981 Kings High School graduate, spent 30 years as a custodian, four of those just down the road in Lebanon, and fortunately for us, 26 in Kings, most recently at Kings High School. Jim is enjoying retirement as he now feels as though he can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. <laughs> However, he does keep himself very busy with projects all around the house. Congratulations, Jim. Last, but certainly not least, Ms. Kathy Wells has spent the last 32 years in the King's local school district, also as a speech and language pathologist, most recently in our King's Early Childhood Center. She is very much looking forward to traveling in retirement. In fact, she already has trips planned for Puerto Rico and Alabama with friends and family. Congratulations, Kathy. If you would, please, one last round of applause for our King's Local School District retirees. I am, however, going to ask you to please come up one more time to take a group photo with our, our Board of Education. It is. <laughs> That might have stamina. That's Can you see uh, Deb? Well, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Um, you know, our teachers, they do a lot more than just teach. They're nurturing, they're loving. They do a lot of things on the outside that we don't know. 
Well, last month, I got a great story about some of our teachers and staff at Columbia Intermediate. During the air assessments, um, there was a student noticed that another student was choking. And they told Mrs. Preston, who's here, let's have her come up, Sharon Preston, and let's bring up Karen Frecker, and let's bring up uh, Kelly McKiernan from Columbia. They're not going to like that. They made a but we're just, so this is Sharon here, and then the nurse, Karen Frecker, and the media specialist, Kelly McKiernan, they all work as a team over there at Columbia. And Mrs. Preston, once she found out that the student was choking, she immediately called for Kelly to call the nurse, call Karen, and Sharon immediately started use, performing the Heimlich maneuver on the student, and she worked on the student for about five minutes, and um, finally a mint that the student was eating popped out. Oh, five minutes. I'm sorry. So it's not five minutes. So five minutes, Pat. Okay. Okay. I, I apologize for that. I did a sort of every time. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> It truly was a team effort and a very timely response of all the adults involved, and it really made a positive outcome for our student. But, you know, our staff, they participate in lots of training every year, and without this training, that outcome could have been completely different. So we're just really proud of Mrs. Preston and Mrs. Frecker and Mrs. McKiernan for your quick actions, and um, we just want to tell you a job well done. So congratulations. Yeah. I'll just I'll give it to Pusha. Okay, you get to listen to me again, but this is a really great thing. So we've got really great students, as everyone knows here at King's. Um, we had 16 students that, that are part of the Business Professional of America at the high school, and they traveled to national. So to be a national qualifier, you really have to do a really great job. So any of my BPA students who are here tonight, we have, a, they have 16 of them, but I'm not sure they all could come. So if you were in a BPA, come on up. I'm going to name everyone's name so you can't get out of it. So um, I have Nora Spellick, Alex Schmidt, Ella Lynn, Justin Garter. Max Astapenko, Evan West, Liam Dooley, Colin Hunter, Reese Wagner, Grant Anderson, Lauren Gallit, uh, Lexi Stierwald, Brittany Glaus, Aspen Goodwin, Dominic Rosiak, and Franklin Dominguez Davis. So 16 students, they went traveled to Anaheim, California um, for the, the national leadership of the BPA. So the BPA is the nation's leading career and technical student organization for students pursuing careers in business management, information technology, finance, accounting office administration, and other business-related fields. The National Conference is known as the ultimate event for Business Professionals of America members. The conference brings together an estimated 6,000 delegates from across the country to vie for top honors in business, finance, technology, marketing, and health administration skill competitions. They attend leadership and professional development workshops, and they receive awards for community service activities, and select, they elect their BPA 2023-2024 National Student Leadership Team. So I just want to go over some of the the accolades and some of the awards that, that our students won, because it's amazing. So... Aspen Goodwin, she placed second in the nation in computer, computer technology or computer network technology, and she placed fifth in the, in the nation for information technology concepts. Second place in the nation, Justin Garter, Max, Max Astapenko, Evan West, and Dominic Rosiak in network design team. Um, and also Dominic got third place in the um, informational technology concepts, and Evan got ninth place in information technology concepts. In second place in the nation, Nora Spellick uh, and Reese Wagner won the 2D animation team. Seventh place in the nation, Brittany Gows, Ella Linehan, Grant Arneson, and Alexa Steerwalt in branding team. And 10th in the nation, Laura Gallette, Lauren Gallette on multimedia and promotion individual. So, you know, you can imagine being up there with 6,000 other people. It's the cream of the crop, the best of the best. And I just want to make sure we got recognized. Now, tell me who's here tonight. Justin? 
and Evan. So we're really proud of you guys. We're so glad that you came. Um, I wanted the board to be able to recognize you tonight because getting to the national level is not easy and you clearly are very much excelling in your field. So congratulations and good luck to you. And I have something for you too. Awesome. Oh, let me get a picture. Yeah, of course. Okay, let me see this one. Too. Oh, wait. Oh. Okay, this way, guys. One more. Perfect. Thank you. Congratulations. How do I think we have a raised presentation? Is that next? Yes, we do. So, if we can get Grace and Faithlin to come on up here, we wanted to also recognize them tonight. Um, Grace and Faithlin with Mrs. Eldridge, they've been coming to board meetings every month to um, tell us all the great things that are happening with the RAISE program and all the things that are happening at King's High School. And, you know, they're students, they have jobs, they're in sports, they have other activities. And so it means a lot to us as a district that they come here um, once a month and they prepare a, a presentation for us. And it's not easy to get up here and speak in front of adults. So um, it takes a lot of bravery and effort and we're really proud of them for that. So I wanted to give you guys each a certificate. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And then I also have for you, um, I got you guys a teaching. Thank you can you. use that for your dorm, for your yeah. dorm. Yeah, and I, I have something for Mrs. Eldridge too. And then did our guys already leave from, um, did yeah. they leave? Oh, here the, here's one. I got you guys okay. tomorrow. So, okay. So let's have it. Let me put your presentation. That's all right. That's great. Hi, <laughs> guys. <laughs> Grace and Faith Lynn, just so you know, we, we very much look forward to these every month. Thank you. Thank you. All right. As we all know, I'm Grace and this is Faith Lynn. This is our last time doing this this year. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, so many irons in the tire. I get it. I get it. <laughs> Um, first, we're going to start off with music. The King's Choir had their end of the year concert on May 4th. Congratulations to the singing class of 2023. We have Cora Dw Dwyer, Jody Burnside, Luke Royer, Kirsten Edmonds, Emily Lynch, Sophia Canino, Sophie Horn, Cooper Lawson, Gavin Turner, Raiden Adams, Regan Milfaller, Sammy Patterson, Belle Cantrell, Sydney McCam, and Sherry Patrick. Ceramics 1, 2, and 3 will be creating a bowl for their exam for the Empty Bowl fundraiser at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church to benefit the Loveland Life Food Pantry in October of 2023. Since Mrs. Gould already <laughs> told all the names, we won't go through all of them again. <laughs> But um, so all the BPA students got to go to nationals, which is really exciting. And there's a link below that you can check out for the results. And then the French four and French five students visit Cami once a week for five weeks to teach a little French to one of the third grade for one of the classes of the third graders. And then Frau Koenig's fourth bell class continued working with the third graders at Cami. And then this fi the final Spanish club meeting was put, was this past Thursday. They celebrated a great year by breaking their pinatas that they made the past two meetings. Thank you, National Honor Society. For teacher appreciation last week, the NHS members gifted a pretzel snack to KHS staff members. Athletics. The baseball team has a record of 17 and 8. They played their last um, in season or in conference. What do you call that? Tournament? Before tournament? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. We're going on the fly with this one. You can tell. <laughs> and they played their last game against Fairfield on the 11th. The softball team has a record of 8 
16 and six. They played their last regular season game on the eighth against Centerville. And then the men's lacrosse team has a record of 14 and three. They played their last regular season game against Turpin on the 10th and one. And then the lady lacrosse team has a record of 10 and six, and they played Turpin on the 11th and one in overtime. It was a pretty close game. And then the men's tennis team has a record of five and seven. They played against Fenwick on the eighth and went five and oh on senior night. Congratulations. And then the track and field team travels to Mason Mason for districts tomorrow. Good luck, track athletes. The rail car project in engineering one. Mr. Meisner's Engineering One Students program are Duinos with range detectors, DC motors, and servo motors to power the cars and get them to stop as close to the blue arrow as possible. They will continue on to phase two where they pick up a payload with the servo motor and drop it on a target. And then there's a video there. <laughs> <laughs> all right and then the king's freshman camp which the race team is a part of and it hosts so king's freshman camp was may 4th and 5th we had a total of 150 high schoolers participate and work with the 365 eighth graders. All the incoming freshmen come to the high school for two days. The race team members and high schoolers provide tours of the high school, taught them about the pillars of rays and help calm the fears that the incoming freshmen may have about coming to the high school. It was so much fun and everyone had an awesome time. Career quest. Conduit apprentice program is an apprentice program created by a group of local home builders. Jerry Bierman with Alluring Glass leads the program, but the group of business leaders is interested in promoting the fields of carpentry, electrical, plumbing, and HVAC to high school students. They've created a program that they bring to local high schools where they work with a small group of students for two days to frame, wire, drywall, and paint a wall. Students get a first-hand look at a career to, to wait, sorry, to, <laughs> to the trades, and they get the satisfaction of building a wall and seeing it stand, which is kind of cool. <laughs> Little Miami hosted the event last week and Debbie Henderson took a couple students as part of our KHS Career Quest program. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I will be graduating on Sunday and I just wanted to thank you so much for letting me have this opportunity. Um, before coming out, I was really nervous. I had a really kind of a little problem with speaking to new people and like being able to prevent or present in front of new people. and. Let's just say this has helped a lot. I am ready for college, I feel like. Um, so I will be attending Wittenberg University next fall. And I just wanted to say thank you. I'm not graduated. I'm a freshman, but um, this was a really good experience, especially as my first year in high school. And I'm really glad I got this experience. And I hope I can be back next year to present again and yeah so thank you for that thank you don't go don't go yet okay don't just put the flowers in front of me so no that's all right so i just wanted we had some flowers here for you grace and uh val, val uh, for you all I'm, I'm looking for you uh and i just wanted to say if, if i may on behalf of all of us grace i would never guess that you had Trouble speaking in front of crowds. Yes. You two have been amazing. Thank you. Uh, coming in here every month, keeping us informed on all these wonderful things that are going on and standing in front of this group of adults. Uh, it's been quite impressive. And um, I'll see you on, su on Sunday. Yes. yes. I hope to see you next year with a new partner. I'm putting them on the spot. But, uh, <laughs> and yeah, we have some um, flowers for the three of you. Appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Girls, I just want to tell you, you, you really have been a bright spot. And uh, if you ever need a letter of recommendation, I think you have five people up here. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and Grace will tell you, but anytime you need anything, please let us know. Yes, absolutely. We love having students come. Yep. Thank you, guys. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Malcolm, I'll just add to this, sure. but these guys have been incredible all year with their preparation, but I'll, I want to commend Grace as well, because, you know, I, I walked into the King's freshman camp and Grace was leading the entire um, two days. And so to see your growth over from the beginning of the year, when you first stepped in front of the mic to at the end of the year, you're closing out your senior year, leading the King's freshman camp and bringing in new eighth graders, just ter tremendous growth. And I, I know you're pursuing your career in education and um, we'd like to say you'd have a golden ticket to come back and interview with us for a job one day. Um, no guarantee, but you got a good one, right? But we would, uh, we'd welcome an opportunity for you, but look, look forward to see your growth. And Faithland, for a freshman to take those steps and do that, um, it's tremendous. And um, not, not many students your age would be interested in putting them themselves in front of adults to see you grow as well has been tremendous and this is the opportunities for students are why we do the work and it's why we're here is to see kids grow take risks step out of their comfort zone um we love seeing it so thanks for the board to allow allowing that to happen and, cre and creating space every single month but I, i'd be remiss not to say we have two amazing king's high school teachers yes. that um without your guidance without your leadership without your support, without your persistence to ensure it, it you're, you're in it for the right reasons and you're in it for kids. Um, and it's demonstrated every single day. We appreciate all that you do each and every day. Um, so thank you. So our last presentation, and I'm gonna have, turn this over to Mr. Bucky for an introduction, but um, in a few, maybe two months ago or so, we had the Board of Education, we presented some information and um, approved an opportunity for us to have a, a capacity study done using Cropper GIS as our consultant. And so we're fortunate tonight that Matthew Cropper is here with us this evening to present information. I'm going to have Mr. Lucky at this point um, do the introduction. So this will be a presentation, but we'll be open for board questions at any time throughout. I think Matt will set the stage for that as well. So absolutely, I don't want to steal a whole lot of the thunder of the presentation, uh, but been working with Mr. Cropper since we decided to go in that direction. Um, Mr. Cropper, I did want to say everyone didn't leave just because you're up next. <laughs> so the room got a little bit lean with your presentation. Uh, but on the side note that I just overheard Mr. Leist and Mr. Cropper talking, Mr. Cropper's daughter, I believe, just graduated from the high school where Mr. Spinner's brother is the principal. Oh, and yes. Yes. in Columbus. So and that is um, a small world. Yes. So I don't want to see anything. I know Matt has a lot of great information I haven't got. And then at the end, uh, I'll, I may chime in a little bit. And then I've got some information to share um, based on the information that you're going to receive. So, Mr. Cropper. Thank you, Mr. Lucky and members of the board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. It's a hard act to follow with all these amazing awards and recognitions. You guys have a lot to be a prou proud of with the students and staff here in this district, certainly. Uh, Matthew Cropper with Proper GIS Consulting, and we're based out of Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio. We work with districts all over the country. You could go to the next slide, I, I believe, uh, just a little bit of an intro, and the next one, please. Uh, this, this is our company, Cropper GIS Consulting. We specialize in um, uh, this type of work that we're doing for you, school capacity studies, 
We do a lot of school uh, redistricting work. We do a lot of demographic study and population enrollment forecasting work and facility planning. But here, um, we're, our role in this particular effort with the district is to, um, is to work on a capacity study as well as a demographic study. And we're gonna be um, still working on that part. But the capacity study is what I'm here to present to you tonight. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, Matthew Cropper, I have over 23 years experience in doing this kind of work for school districts all across the United States. Um, and we've done, we do probably 30 or 40 different projects a year, and we've been in business since 2005. So um, we bring a lot of expertise to, to the table and what other districts, how other districts have dealt uh, with, with similar challenges and uh, other issues. And um, and honored to be here working with you. I also work uh, as an expert for the U.S. Department of Justice, the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, I provide consultation regarding uh, federal desegregation lawsuits. Believe it or not, there are many of those still out there that we work with uh, trying to resolve. And also published numerous papers uh, and uh, known as an expert in this industry, in this in this the GIS industry and master planning uh, for schools. Uh, this is just a list of some of the schools that we've worked with recently, a lot of schools in Ohio, but like I said, we work with school districts all over the United States and uh, honored to be here working a little bit closer to home on this particular project. So we're here because we were hired by the district, as I said, to develop a, a, a series of tasks. A capacity study is one of those, and that's what we just recently completed over the um, last couple of weeks. Um, we're also tasked to do an enrollment forecast, a demographic study. That work is still underway. And I imagine you'll, we'll, I'll be back at some point to, to share the results of that. And we'll be merging the two together, the enrollment and capacity, and talking about utilization and what utilization looks like now and what it looks like in the future. But the first step is to get a good handle on your school capacity and a good understanding of how many um, seats each building has and how many uh, students each building could adequately hold before that building becomes overcrowded. And so uh, the primary tasks that we were uh, we did to, to, to tackle this capacity study was to first meet with the school principals and administrators. I was here a week or two ago and walking through the buildings. Um, I collected a lot of information uh, prior to that visit, uh, floor plans and information and discussions with the district, um, and just talking with the principal at, at first at, the, at each school, talking to them about their building, how the building feels, and uh, what are some of the pressures and, and bottleneck points with the school, and where, where they may see crowding going on, or where they have space or where they don't have space. And then we did a walkthrough and um, I'll walk through the building, looking at the different classroom types and the, the sizes of building, of rooms throughout the building. Um, and we looked at a floor plan together before we did that walkthrough, just to make sure that I'm clear on all the spaces that exist in the building and what are actual classroom spaces versus may not, may look like a classroom on a floor plan, but may be the boiler room and those types types of things, for example. So just making sure that we all clear on the, the, the actual educational spaces in the building. Um, after that visit, I calculated the capacity, school capacity, by using a best, best practices in, in terms of class size assumptions. And uh, we, I've done, uh, probably I've walked through probably four or 500 buildings and um, done calculated capacities for schools across the country. And so I bring a lot of that perspective of best practices and what's, what's usually the best, uh, most ideal for class size uh, for, for typical schools of different, of different grades and those types of things. And then finally, I have a written report that I've delivered to you uh, for, your, for your review and consideration um, that summarizes all the methodology and some of the information and in, in my findings. If you can go to the next slide. So like I said, we visited uh, just a few weeks ago uh, and toured the buildings and uh, met with the administrators. Um, there, you could see there's a table on the, on the chart on the slide that shows the different class size assumptions that I was using for the different grade configurations that exist throughout your, your school. Everything from eight students all the way up to 20, uh, 27 students per classroom. And they, the, those, those do vary. The, the eight, eight students per classroom is, is really a class size for the, the high incidence special education settings is students who have a severe uh, uh, profound disabilities and often are wheelchair bound and they have 
a staff member or as an aide working with them. So they require a lot more space inside their setting. And, and so we're, we're, we're assuming eight students per class per room in a setting like that for students of that, of that type. And as you can see, at pre-K, I've, I've uh, allocated 12 students per classroom, and then that number goes up as you get to the older grades, all the way up to 27 to 1 in, um, in grades 7 through 12. Um, and so these are, these are good numbers to use in terms of an average number for class sizes. There are varying, some schools uh, have programs, especially the upper grades, have different, different class offerings. Some classes, maybe a health class may have 30 or 40 kids in it, where you have other more specialized classes that may only have 12. So that so it's important to note that these are an this is an average number uh, in terms of a class size assumption for for the classrooms in, in each particular grade level. Um, like I said, we met with each principal to understand how the room, the building was being used. And I, I always say that principals are the most resourceful people I've ever met. They, um, they make use, if, if they're overcrowded, they will make use of every single space. And they'll make it almost look like the building isn't over, overcrowded. They're making use of all of the available space. Um, sometimes they'll take closets and other types of, I've seen students inside boiler rooms and those types of things. Um, and so they, they make use and they adapt to what they have to, to, to how to manage and, and deliver education. Likewise, on the other hand, if a school has a lot of excess capacity, you'll see the principals make use of that space. They'll spread out into that space and they'll give, say, for example, a, a resource teacher who may only need three hours a day a full classroom and um, because there's a, it may be an available classroom there for them to use. So they're very resourceful. And, and, and so the, one of the challenges in doing this, this job, this capacity study, is to identify how they're using the building, but then also identifying what they need in order to offer, deliver the same quality of education that they're, that they're delivering there. So many times, I, um, if a building was overcrowded, I actually allocated a room or two or where, wherever I felt appropriate for resource and pull out if there was none there in an overcrowded setting. In other cases, there may be some excess space and I, and I counted a room that may be used as a resource room as um, a general classroom. And I counted that in the classroom capacity. So that does, there are some judgment calls that have to be made in, in, in identifying spaces that need to be used versus spaces that they are using and, and ultimately giving them a number that they that can adequately uh, that the building can adequately hold without compromising the quality of education. Um, and uh, I don't know, another point in the capacity study for elementary schools, certain spaces are not included in the capacity. So resource and pull out rooms. And you'd have to have spaces for students to, to, be, to come out for individual instruction, maybe one or two or three at a time. And th those spaces are important. The, some of the older buildings like you guys uh, have a couple, they're not, they weren't designed to have those. They're just really uh, a corridor kind of and like what you see in this building is a corridors with classrooms on both sides. There are there is no room designated or side space designated for that individual one on one instruction. Newer schools have that built in uh, there in the design. They have a lot of these resource spaces built into it, and they're not you don't have to take a full classroom for it. But um, music and art rooms, I did not count in the capacity because we don't want to. We want to make sure that those are maintained for for their specific uses, and then resource and pull out rooms. Uh, or not counted a capacity. This is what I refer to as a functional capacity. Um, sometimes you'll see other capacity numbers, and it's it's an age old debate. School capacity. Um, the sometimes you'll hear what's called as a design capacity, and that's what the architect typically puts a number on the building or the fire code puts a number on the building. And that's typically calculated by looking at total square footage of a building. And then they use a square foot per student factor to calculate how the ca capacity of that school. The problem with the design capacity is a design capacity often uses, um, it includes every space in the building. So auditoriums, cafeterias, um, uh, even the hallways and corridors are included in that square footage calculation. So, um, so it's not, it's usually the design capacity is gonna be on the high side of what students could actually, how many students the building could hold. A functional capacity takes a look at classroom settings, 
yeah. educational spots and spaces in the building and make sure that we have space set aside for those resource and uh, pull out instruction and other special instruction uh, categories that are delivered in school. Uh, if you go to the so next. Do you, did you analyze like gym space, auditorium space? Or it, no, that's not in. Not really. It's mostly, I'm focused more on classroom space, okay. but I do comment uh, in my, um, my, my notes in the, in my report, I make comments on those, what I call the core space. And sometimes core spaces have, um, I've been through a lot of enough buildings to know when there's not enough core space. For example, maybe the corridors are too small or the gym is too small or the cafeteria may be too small to serve the students in there. And Burns is a good example of that. Um, it's a building that has a lot of, uh, has had a lot of additions put on it over the, since it was originally constructed. Mm -hmm. And you could tell that although there is a good number of classrooms in that building, the core capacity of that building probably is too small to handle well, even what, um, almost what I have calculated because there is there is a lack of that core capacity. So I note it and I and I and I document when I see there's a stress on the core capacity, but I don't actually calculate capacity of those spaces in my study. Um, for junior high and high schools, sometimes there are settings where there's a, a sort of lab and then a uh, and then a lab space and then a classroom next door to it. And um, often you know, the, the way that that building, that, that space is designed, the students do a lab and then they go to a classroom setting and then they do their, their, their desk instruction and things like that. In those types of settings, in that type of scenario, I would not count both the lab and the classroom as in the capacity. I would only count the desk part of that, that setting. But in, in, in this district, I think you have more integrated labs where the lab and, and class and sort of setting is all in one room, and in those cases, I do count that in the in the capacity. Um, but there are other other spots that aren't necessarily counted, like the uh, choir room and the band room, and those types of things are really more for special instruction and not not counted in the actual classroom capacity for those upper for those upper schools. the The goal is to to envision could could a, could this be used as a classroom for for, for students with general instruction and, um, and knowing that students uh, migrate throughout the building in those upper upper schools, um, making sure there's enough space for those students to do that and be, and be taught in the different types of programs that are offered at the buildings. Um, so once I, once I calculated and did my, uh, my site visits, I took the floor plan and I itemized all of the rooms that, are, that were counted in the capacity. And you'll see in my report in the back on the notes that I have, uh, you'll see marks for the rooms that I've counted in, in each building and ones, that, and ones that don't have a highlight mark or ones that were not counted. So it's pretty straight and clear uh, on my, my methodology, my process, and you'll understand what I did and what I did not count. And um, and I'm, I'm fair, but I'm also, but I'm not also too conservative. I wanna make sure that that it's a good number that's that's best use of the resources in the district, but also not uh, risking an overcrowding situation in the number that I that I put out there. Um, like I said, some of those spaces, some of the schools uh, did not have uh, resource and pull out rooms and certain ends of the of wings or hallways. There was just no, nothing there for for certain grade levels in certain buildings, and in those cases, I set them aside, one room aside as as a resource. And you'll see that in my notes, uh, as well as on the floor plans, where I assumed certain spaces to, that were were or were not included in the in the capacity. And then, a, finally, one thing to note is that best practice is to take once you calculate that capacity to uh, you have a number and then to apply what they call a utilization factor and the utilization factor is important because um, you'll see that for elementary school I used a 90 percent utilization factor so once I get my get my calculation I take 10 percent of that number off and that in uh, for for the middle or the junior high I use 80 percent and for high school I use 75 percent and the reason is is that um, especially at the high high level you see the number gets the utilization factor gets greater or, or um, taking more off and that's because the 
the way schools are programmed and classes are programmed, there are uneven class sizes at, um, at different types of programs and things like that. And when you get to the upper grades, students travel to the teacher. They don't, they, they, they migrate in between periods. And so you have to have adequate space and uh, factored in for the uneven nature of class sizes at the intermediate and, ju and uh, junior high and high school level, as well as, um, uh, un uh, as well as giving students the ability to migrate back and forth and making sure that there's adequate space for just the nature of how high school is different from elementary school. Elementary, I use a 90% factor, uh, so that using most of the space that I have counted in that, in that number that I have for elementary schools. And, um, but I did uh, have a, a small factor taken out just to, to give them a little bit more space for, to be able to, um, to, be able to, to, to handle different, different periods and uh, students you know, traveling more really for a factor of accounting for the core spaces. Um, this uh, table shows you the results of my capacity study. You'll see uh, the itemized number of classrooms that are counted and applied that number to the class size assumptions that I had uh, presented to you. And that gives you a total classroom capacity. I also have an itemized um, list of the, of the resource and pull out and special use rooms, more so for the elementary and the uh, intermediate school than for the junior high and high school, because those are kind of intermingled a lot in um, the way that the way that education is delivered. So this is the result and uh, the classroom capacities are the other capacity figures. You'll notice that the Burns temporary trailers, um, I, I kept it as a separate line item because we only use that permanent capacity when we do this, this calculation. But that facility that that the temporary trailers out there are, um, they've got sidewalk paved to them and things like that. And so I want to just give you a perspective of how many much space is in that in that building. I do know that Burns over time as it's been built out, they they keep losing their play space and their their green space. It's evident. So they are they are they are pretty much uh building and there's not a whole lot of green space. Those trailers are actually on their ball field. And so it would be it would be recommended to um, the, the ultimate goal is to not have to utilize trailers and to be out of the trailers. And that's something that um, that that I would recommend that it hopefully in the long run that you um, that you work towards the goal of not being reliant on those trailers. I don't think it's something that you can avoid right now, but it's but I wanted to give you a separate line item for those so you knew how much space you had if you included that in the number. And then if you look at the next slide, and just a little comparison of the of current enrollment or the October fall enrollment um, to the capacity, and then you see school utilization. So um, your, your buildings are pretty crowded. They're, they are over 100%. Um, there are uh, a lot of students in these, in, these school, in these schools, and you'll see, you know, classroom capacity or School utilization of 115 percent, and how how is that? Well, in, in in some cases, what for Burns they were using the temporary trailers, but in in the other buildings, you'll see that they're basically um, utilizing every last space they can make use of inside that building, and um, many times they don't have adequate pullout spaces uh, to use, and um, and also class sizes are are higher in some settings where. They start just to have no choice but to have more students per classroom, and so this this is the this is what we will use as a basis for our next steps when we start doing the enrollment. When we finish the enrollment forecast, we will look at current utilization, which this is your starting point, and then we'll look at how this utilization changes over the next ten years, and uh, that'll give you a good idea on if you're, if you're overcrowded now, are you going to stay overcrowded, or is it going to get better, or is it going to get worse based off of forecast and enrollment. And I'll be back and then uh, at my next presentation to share that information with you. Um, like I said, the report has all of my detailed notes for the, on the floor plans and also notes about each building that I took uh, as a result of my field visits. So you uh, feel free to look through those. And if you ha have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I have one, which you, you may have just answered in your last comment there, but looking at the elementary schools, we've got Burns for K, K 
K through two, 21, and then for third and fourth, you got 12. Those numbers are significantly different for KME and SLE. What, what's the main driver for, for that? The, um, in terms of the, the classroom, the total capacity? Right, you've got the capacity. It's, uh, if you go, yeah, that slide right there. So you've got 21 and 12 for Burns and 17 and 10 for KME and then 14 and nine for, uh, for South Lebanon. Um, what, what, why are those numbers different by each school? Um, well, those are the classrooms that basically the sum of the classrooms that I had um, counted in each building. Okay. And so there are there is a, there is a difference in total number of rooms between the two buildings. As you can see, there's a difference of four to mm -hmm. classrooms total. And um, and there in South Lebanon has one fewer third through fourth and then uh, three. Okay. So those aren't class sizes. Those, those are number of classrooms. Those are counts. OK. OK. Yes, I, I sir. Thank yes, you. Sir. For, well, thank you for count, clarifying. The count of classrooms. Yes, sir. I have a question that might be to you, Mr. Sears and our administration. Uh, Mr. Cropper's assumptions with respect to class sizes, how does that align with our expectations on class ratios uh, currently? Is that about where where we are? I would say those is, those um, Cropper recommended class size assumptions are comparable to current class size ratios in general. Um, we There will be variations at various grade levels. Some might have a little bit more, some may have a little less, but in general, I think those align with the generalized ratios that our, our teachers are currently experiencing right now. Okay. Yeah, again, it's an average right. of, of a snapshot of it. And with the neighborhood elementaries, it can be a little bit different to, to make that work just sure. based on numbers of second graders per se in the, in the three different buildings. We, we try for equity in that, but you, you can see how it, it can get a little bit wonky. They're not all in the same place. Absolutely. And could you talk a little bit? I'm sorry, I, did anyone else have a question? Just get all of mine out. Keep, keep going, you might be, you've asked stuff my value. Excuse me. So with respect to uh, this building, uh, I'm just looking at your uh, your note here at the bottom. So you're, you're, you're factoring utilization off of half of that capacity. Correct. Okay. Yes, the total, the total capacity, mm -hmm. uh, um, the total, so this this is the slide right here. Yes, the total yeah. classroom capacity for this first floor is 158 students, uh, assuming that they are pre-K, uh, it's a pre-K use. Um, but that, what I did was that is an A, they have an AM and PM program. So usually they'll take, um, when you calculate some similar to FTE, a full-time enrollment, okay. right. uh, full-time equivalent, I take half of that to show that in reality, um, there's 208 enrolled, but in reality, only half of those students are in the building at any particular time. Gotcha. So that's how that, why that number's like that. Gotcha. If you didn't offer child care. That was Rob, my next question. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. And, and this may help um, guide some questions. We went through this process uh, and went through building by building. And I, I just took some highlighted things because you you will look at those numbers and say, how are we doing school? With the numbers that we have. So as Mr. Cropper said, our principals are the most creative people that exist, and they are. And I, I just want to give you some highlights of what's going on in the, at the building level where you, where you can see those higher percentage of uh, of usage. So just at the high school, I've got a lot of things here, but just to, just to take the highlights. And, and, and this doesn't even take into account the cafeteria. So the high school to do lunch, uh, there's not enough cafeteria space. So we just keep adding tables all the way down that hallway and that foyer and that, and that area for kids to eat. Um, it overextends the lunchroom. Uh, it overextends our support staff on supervising the lunch. Uh, it takes away instructional time because we, we have to do Four lunches in the building, so really, really in all the buildings, I could say as a bullet point, we eat lunch all day 
because our cafeterias aren't able to take on the number of kids that we need to take them on. So you're looking at elementaries that are eating from 1030 to two o'clock. When we do a delay or snow here, we're just eating all day. As soon as they get off the bus, they're eating lunch yeah. just so that we can get them all fed. Um, high school, again, SLP sessions occur in the book closet. Uh, there's not enough restrooms in the high school for the number of people we have. Uh, we, we, we deal with a lot of restroom issues just because we don't have enough of them. There's one boys and one girls upstairs. Uh, and there's only a, a, a couple places downstairs. So we make classroom transitions. It's a bottleneck just dealing with the bathroom issues. So since they can't use the restroom during the class change, they're having to leave class to be able to use the restroom and they're losing instructional time. So it's, it's creating issues uh, all over the building. Um, hall storage closets are being used for counseling sessions and mind peace, uh, traveling teachers for health, English, foreign language, uh, server closets are being used in every building. So let me paint a picture of what it's like to have a small group instruction in a server closet. So a server closet, I got to keep it 65 degrees so that the server survives. So it's a little brisk in there. So everybody brings a sweater in those situations in every building. So every building in our district, there's a server closet and there's a, there's learning going on in there. Um, junior high, there's a classroom in the foyer. So you walk in the front door, through the glass doors of the front door, you see a Spanish class going on. We force you to take a left to go in through the main office but there's a class going on in the foyer. The building was not designed to have a classroom right there. The stage is a classroom in that building. Um, in 2020, 23, 24, we're gonna have three special ed teachers sharing a single classroom in the junior high, just due to crowdedness. At Columbia, hall storage closets are used for group instruction. Uh, the stage is used for class. Um, the teacher lunchroom, we just converted to gifted services. Uh, for next year, the teacher workroom is being changed into special education classroom. Uh, last summer, we quadrant it off 30% of the media center, the library, to create three small breakout spaces on the backside. So we basically shrunk our, our library situation at uh, Columbia to be able to create spaces uh, for people to learn. At Burns, uh, this summer, we're breaking up the multipurpose room. Uh, to make nine small group pullout stations in the building. Um, there's eight temporary trailers out back. Uh, storage rooms are being used for instruction. Uh, storage room is used for counseling services. We do art at Burns. Part of our art program is in the cafeteria. So just cleaning up after that through the school day when you're trying, like, it just creates... Uh, pain points all over the place. So this is that piece Mr. Crapper was referring to, the core spaces are inadequate mm -hmm. at this point? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you look at the high school, auditorium, gym, we don't, we don't have enough spaces where you can bring whole classes or groups of classes or the building to, to present at one time. Uh, at all of our elementaries, they're, they're bringing in, like in the good old days, uh, they bring in, you know, all of the second grade and they would do a performance or they bring bring them all in at one time. We don't have space at JF Burns to be able to do that. Uh, so you'll see a, a strung along week of yeah. chorus concerts for three and four teachers at a time because uh, there's not enough parking to park everybody down at Burns. That's just just a side uh, pain point that, that you got to manage and deal with uh, as a staff. And all of those items are in that second attachment. Is that correct? He's got notes in there, and I went through and just did some bulleted. Uh, what are we doing to be able to have a school with with percentages of usage like that? And I can share that with you guys. Okay, because I just see on this for on, you know, I'm just taking the high school for example. It says 52 classrooms, 1,053 kids, and then you go to the next slide, and we see that the actual school utilization number. So I, um, but that's really not getting the whole picture. That's just classroom. Like we're not looking at all the other stuff. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
Wow. I'm just trying to capture that cafeteria situation when you go there for lunch and you walk in the front door and a quarter of that building's on top of you as you make your way down that hall and tables just keep on going. We've made it to the gym so far. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll be to the junior high before it's all said and done. Did you analyze like when you have a class change, like the amount of kids walking through the hallway? Yes, I, I always like to... I always ask to be at the most crowded intersection during a change in periods. And we did, we were there and it was very crowded and very congested when they were when after, in between bells. And I, and at the high school, I, I have it in my notes about how the cafeteria, the eating spaces has basically spilled, taken half of the entryway. Um, and so it's, it's evident when you walk through that, that those core spaces are, are, are overstressed with because of the number of students in the building, um, and so yeah, and I I um, I think that using the looking at it in terms of classroom capacity is the best way to do it, but it's very important to have a good understanding of the core as well and what can the core handle because say for example, you think of a your one solution is to expand or put another wing on a school. You may not be able to put another wing on a school if the core spaces don't have any space. Like Burns certainly couldn't take a classroom addition because their core spaces are over capacity. Same thing as the high school. Um, without, without doing something to address your core space constraints, you can't just add uh, an eight to 10 classroom wing on a building unless you have that core space available to adapt to that. Yeah, we camped out right behind the counselor's office at the high school, if you're familiar with that building. Uh, that is uh, a pinch point of pinch points, uh, to say the very least. So we spent some time there. Uh, the transitions through Burns, um, just because there's not a lot of flow. You know, all of our other buildings, there is a, is a distinct flow when they kept adding on to Burns, the, the giant Tetris game, I like to call it. Um, there is no flow there. So to get from one end, you're passing everybody to get to every location in there. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just, you know, we have the subject matter expert here, um, put you on the spot a little bit. Uh, so just in your expert opinion, uh, in observing sort of the pinch points in our high school, Jeff Burns, like, how severe do you think it is? Uh, I it's it's not the worst I've seen, but it is. I I would say that on a scale of one to ten, the, the high, looking at the high school, you're at about an eight uh, or eight and a half. It's it's you're getting to a critical point where it's becoming unsafe and uh, for just just the whole the core spaces alone are. Um, limited limited for that that building and so i think i think you do have an overcrowding situation going on at at all three levels and what i what i would recommend is well, what my thoughts are is to this is the first step second step is to look at what the 10 year forecast says and to determine is there is it anything is enrollment going to stay stable or is it going to get any worse and that helps kind of paint a picture for Helping to identify your needs in the long term, is it a um, is is a solution to address your overcrowding, um, ex, uh, classroom additions or expansions if you have it available, or is it something like uh, maybe a, a replacement building to replace uh, an, an old building that has a little bit more space, or is it a an entirely new building to add on to the stock of schools you have? That's still I haven't. Uh, don't have enough data to be able to give you give, give you that, but um, I think that you definitely have some needs here in terms of overcrowding that need to be addressed. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Mr. Cropper? Um, just for reference, the responses on the in your report on the capacity study site visit questions. Those are based on conversations with the principal. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, we had that. We I gave them the questionnaire in advance. Um, I told them they didn't have to fill it out. Those are the questions I was going to ask them in the interviews. And of course, every single one of your principals did it in advance and gave it to me so I could study it 
And I don't always get that. And I really appreciated that. But that was their, that was, those were their answers. And also another question that I ask them when I meet with them is how, how do you, how many students do you think that this building could hold? And I always take note of that. And, and I, it's just fun for me after I do my study, I look and see what does the principal think? And are we way far off or are we close? And in most cases we were somewhat close in terms of what um, I've calculated versus what they've had. They usually underestimate a little bit. And uh, so my, my results are a little bit higher than what they feel that capacity is, but um, they're very, very helpful and very appreciative of your staff giving us the time and helping us out with the study. And when you provide us with some of what your recommendations are, will they come in levels? Like, will there be like a, these are my bare minimum recommendations and, you know, these are, you know, where I really think you need to be, will there be levels or will there just be like one set of recommendations? Well, our, we are, we're not tasked to do, um, provide facility recommendations. So I'm not, part of this, I'm not tasked to say, to give you sort of a, a prescriptive recommendations on, this is what you should do in terms to address your capacity. But what I'm doing is I'm give, I'm providing the utilization forecast and the demographic study work in this to give you that good foundation. And, and I will tell you what I'm seeing and what I'm, what I'm seeing in the data and what, um, what you could consider. But it's, um, I think in order to make uh, a good recommendation, um, some more study has to be done of the actual facility condition and um, information about how much does it cost to renovate a space versus replace it and other things like that, that I'm not a part of that need to come into, into consideration when you, before you make a final decision on what to do to address your utilization uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions for Mr. Crow? So you said you still need to finish up the enrollment forecast? Yes, sir. So when you've done these in the past, have your enrollment projections typically come in accurate? Say if you're looking over a 10-year period for, for a certain district, 10 years down the road, did you come in pretty close? Were you way off? Yes. Uh, it's um, we're, We try to stay within 2% plus or minus of our number through the life of the forecast. And I would say that first, uh, you know, the first five are really, really good on that. Mm -hmm. But you start getting out to the second five, there's always things, it always seems to be in the last 30 years, something happens in that second five that's just a game changer, like COVID or, uh, or like the, um, the 07 bu uh, bubble bust with the, the tech the, and the tech bust and those types of things. Right that we don't anticipate that causes major seismic shifts in migration and home sales activity and those types of things. Um, so when we do our forecast, we identify assumptions. Okay. This is what we are assuming is going to maintain constant through the life. And if those things maintain constant, maintain as we assume, then the forecast will be accurate. Usually if it starts to deviate, it's because of other things that we can't control that are non-demographic gotcha. mm -hmm. and changes in the economy and those types of things that cause fluctuations and nobody can predict that no. right right yeah thank you what's what's the timeline for the next step we are um making really good progress i think in the next uh couple of weeks we'll have the forecast a demographic study completed so i imagine that sometime uh in the next month or so uh probably be back here and talk with you about the forecast results and um, we haven't really talked about it when on schedule, but we'll get it on the, on the calendar. It'll be during in the next with month, one to two months, I would say at the latest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, and. Next on the agenda is public participation. I see we don't have anyone signed up this evening. Hey, Dave, would you like to, to speak? Oh. Yep, sure. No. So we need to amend, correct? You want to let Since we have one, which are you all? I'm fine. With that. I'm fine. Yeah. 
Okay. You need a motion? Yeah, motion to allow. Motion to uh, yeah, may I have a motion to allow uh, our one uh, public participant? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Mr. Mara? Ms. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Groff? Yes. Ms. Cowan? Yes. Mr. Skrull? Yes. Mr. Belfram? Yes. And could you state your name, sir, for the record? Yes. My name is Damon Lago. I'm a King's parent and also one of the coaches for wrestling. Um, it was brought to my attention. I apologize for the way I'm dressed. We were having open mats tonight. And I apologize if I'm a little upset. Walked into our wrestling room to find that the senior um, prank had been to remove all the chairs and tables and put them on my wrestling mats. Now, our wrestling mats are starting to get towards the end of their life. And we also have other classes that come into that room and other children that go into that room that have started destroying those mats. Upon entering this to the room today, I have rain marks from the chair, from the tables. I have holes, more, more holes in my mats, and I have more damage from where the chairs were. Now, I'm also a nurse, so I keep up on what's recently looking at skin diseases, anything that could be uh, detrimental to my kids for wrestling. And there's a new disease coming out that's ringworm that's not treated by any medication that we have right now other than oral medication. If you put holes in wrestling mats, it predisposes you to having more chances of having these problems. Now, in the past, we've raised money for our mats because we were the only ones using them. But now the school has been using our mats. And I'm coming begging you because our mats are broken down in spots where I don't let the kids wrestle on to look if there's any way that we can do a matching fund. We can have some kind of way of getting some money from the school system to help us replace our mats, especially in light of what just happened today. I have kids up there with one of our coaches right now. And that's why I came over because I felt it was so important that you needed to know about what was going on there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lugo. And I do apologize. I didn't read our public statement about public participation for the purposes of the motion. Let me just get it on the record now. Local Board of Education encourages all parents, staff members, community members to attend meetings, encourages visitors to participate in their meetings. Each speaker has three minutes to state his or her reason for addressing the board. Uh, we ask that speakers avoid personal attacks on individuals during their public address to the board. If an individual has an issue with an employer, we ask that a request a private meeting with the superintendent or that employee's direct supervisor. Please keep in mind that the Board of Education meetings are held so that the board can conduct their business in public. The board president is the spokesman for the board and may need to consult with other board members in order to respond to the public. A question from the public can be immediately answered. It may be, however, if time is needed to study the issue, the board may choose to make a statement at a later date. In this particular case, as we've done in the past, we allowed Mr. Legault, uh, we made a motion, allowed him to speak, and Mr. Legault, that is something that obviously we'll, we'll go back to you on that, sir. All right. Having mm -hmm. said that, next on the consent agenda uh, are the items, the approval items for the tribunal, including the minutes from the work session, minutes from the regular meeting, the financial items. Uh, the five year forecast, the uh, VF, VFW chapter 9622 scholarship, transfer of funds, uh, the amended appropriations and estimated resources, and the public records log. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Morrow concerning the treasurer items? With that, may I have a motion to approve uh, Mr. Morrow's items this evening? I'll make that motion. I'll second the motion. Ms. Groff? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Cowan? Yes. Mr. Skrull? Yes. Mr. Belfron? Yes. Next on the consent agenda um, are the approval items for the superintendent. It's just the fun stuff. <laughs> it's for graduation and the OHSAA membership uh, for the upcoming 2023-24 school year. Uh, do we have any questions for Mr. Sears? 
With that, may I have a motion to approve uh, the items for the superintendent? I'll make that motion. I'll second the motion. <laughs> Mr. Morrow. Ms. Cowan. Yes. Ms. Groff. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Skrull. Yes. Ms. Phillips. Yes. Mr. Belfrom. Yes. Class of 2023, you're official. <laughs> you on time, Mr. Cordini will not be happy. Uh, <laughs> next on the consent agenda uh, are the approval items for the assistant superintendent regarding uh, HR and business. We'll have our second reading of the board policies, uh, a second reading that was rescinded. The food service management agreement for Smoy, our Lockland City School District food service contract. Uh, are there any questions regarding these first four items? That may I have a motion to approve the first four items of the consent agenda regarding the matters of HR and business. I'll make that motion. I'll second the motion. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Skrull. Yes. Ms. Phillips. Yes. Ms. Grawl. Yes. Ms. Cowan. Yes. Mr. Belfam. Yes. And next on the agenda is the uh, list of personnel items uh, under the assistant superintendent regarding HR and business. Were there any questions uh, regarding the personnel items listed? With that, may I have a motion to approve the personnel items? I'll make that motion. I will second the motion. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Cowan? Yes. Mr. Belfrom? Yes. Mr. Skrull? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Grove? I'll abstain. Next on the consent agenda are the approval items for the assistant superintendent regarding our educational programs. Uh, we have the student internship master agreement this evening. Uh, very exciting. Any questions for Mrs. Martin, Mr. Freeman? With that, may I have a motion to approve uh, these items, this item this evening? I'll make the motion. I'll second the motion. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Phillips. Yes. Ms. Groff. Yes. Ms. Cowan. Yes. Mr. Skrull. Yes. Mr. Belfrom. Yes. Next on the agenda are items presented by the Board of Education. Mrs. Phillips. Was there anything you did most of your you did your presentation last week, right? OK, yeah. Uh, but I have something else I can miss me if we have time. <laughs> um, when um, Mr. Skrull and I attended the um, Board Leadership Institute, we heard from a fellow district um, board member that they have a scholarship that the board donates um, $200 per member for um, a high school student um, to receive as one of the scholarships. So that's, I can email you all some more information that uh, I was given and we can see if that's something that we would like to entertain for next school year. Absolutely. Yeah, it was great hearing hearing about that scholarship. And I think as a board, what a better way to help support some of our deserving students. Absolutely. And having been to senior night last night, uh, I felt like we were a little left out, like maybe we should have ourselves a little something. <laughs> uh, was there anything else you uh, wanted to share this evening? It's just that it's the last board meeting of the school year before summer and um i think we all agree just to thank all of our staff for the amazing work Absolutely. they did Absolutely. with our students this year and um wish everybody a very happy safe summer well said miss groff well said uh next and seniors don't be late on sunday i said it again <laughs> <laughs> can't stress that enough. can't, can't stress, stress that enough, enough. And let your parents be emotional. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> next on the agenda are the legislative updates, Mr. Scroll. 
Thank you, President Belfam. So I have included uh, a pretty lengthy list of legislative updates this month. Not, nothing has been presented or signed by Governor DeWine, but there's been a lot of activity uh, with a lot of the different committees. Uh, so if you want to read through those and if you have any questions on any of the House or Senate bills. Um, but one, one item I did want to uh, point out is it's the very last uh, section I have in here about the State Board of Education. Uh, as you're aware, we have a new interim state, state superintendent, and that is Chris Woolard. Um, so um, he, he has been appointed as the state superintendent in interim. Um, and in addition, there's a resolution seeking opinion from the Attorney General's office on Senate Bill 1. Any questions for Mr. Skrull? Thank you for these these updates too, as well, Mr. Skrull there. Very comprehensive. It, it, it's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate all the hard work. Thank you. Next on the agenda uh, is the Student Achievement Liaison update, Mrs. Phillips. Okay. I. I think we all agree as a board, we really take very seriously doing what's best for students all of the time. So my report tonight is some of the different ways we're doing what's best for students and what the teachers are, are doing. So we're proud to announce that for the seventh year in a row, the district has been named the 2023 Best Communities for Music Instruction. The important piece of that is that the designation is awarded to districts that demonstrate outstanding achievement in the effort to provide music access and education to all students. So that's from kindergarten through 12th grade. If you think of all of the times as parents, we've gone to music programs at the elementary level. Um, the chorus and band that starts at Columbia and then continues into the junior high and high school. All of that hard work from all of the music teachers across the district. Um, just thank you so much for having so many students involved. Changing buildings can cause a little extra anxiety for some students. Um, tonight we got to hear about the freshman camp that the high school had. But on that same day, with a lot of planning, fourth graders visited Columbia, sixth graders visited the junior high, and of course, the eighth graders to the high school. And activities included at all of the locations, a tour of the school, team building activities, guest speakers, and a question answer session with appropriate questions from the different grade levels and what was on the students' minds. So that's a, another wonderful thing that the district provides just to ease that uh, anxiety. At KME, the second grade economics project involves students serving snack items to other students in the building, teachers, administrators from across the district and parents. And they were in hopes of raising just a little money for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. The second graders had various roles. They were the servers, the kitchen staff, the cashiers, and the bussers. A little money ended up being $1,806 that they donated to Make-A-Wish Foundation. King's High School students in the multiple disability classroom attended a daylight prom. The prom is held during the school day for Warren County students. King's High School MD students added, staff added personal touches for the students. They gave them manicures, helped them style their hair, and the students also wore candy cane necklaces, and candy lamb themed bracelets. The students walked the red carpet. Thank you, Mr. Corradini, for putting that red carpet out for them as they boarded the bus. And everything I heard was that the, the students uh, all enjoyed a wonderful time, got to meet new friends. The music was a little softer. It wasn't quite as rambunctious as 
the evening prom and so they all loved it and had a great time. 600 students at JF Burns have been participating in a project to help deepen their understanding of what it's like to be a refugee living around the globe. And they did this through artwork. The students were challenged to create postcards that will be sent to young refugees around the world. And the project sponsors, the Bezos Family Foundation is donating $5 to refugee aid organizations for every postcard created. To date, it's not over yet, the students have created 802 postcards raising over $6,000. And they were named the top fundraisers in the state of Ohio. Awesome. So they still have a little bit more time till the 2nd or 3rd of June. So good luck to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Phillips. Next on the agenda is executive session. Uh, we will be entering into executive session uh, for the following purpose preparing for conducting or reviewing negotiations or bargaining sessions with employees. With that, may I have a motion to enter into executive session? So moved, or I'll make that motion. <laughs> You're thinking Warren County, different lingo. I'll second the motion, Mr. Morrow. Ms. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Belfrom? Yes. Mr. Skrull? Yes. Ms. Cowan? Yes. Ms. Groff? Yes turn shortly.
Yeah, excellent executive session. May I have a motion to adjourn this evening's meeting? I will second the motion, Mr. Morrow. Ms. Cowan? Yes. Mr. Belfrom? Yes. Mr. Skrill? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Grow? Yes. Meetings adjourned, class of 2023. Students and please will see you Sunday. Don't be late. Yeah, don't be late.